Um, thanks a lot, Carlos. It's great to be here and it's super to follow Tings, my colleague and comrade. Uh, John, it's a really good book and congratulations for it. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the second time that Radhika and I have the pleasure of talking about this book in public. Uh, and I could talk about this book another five times. So congratulations. Um, I want to spend a little time talking about India and China um, together and look at the comparison as it were. But I want to start with a book published in China in uh, early 1955. It was called The High Tide of Chinese Socialism uh, in the Countryside. And in the beginning of the book, Mao writes something that I have used to write in my notebook when I was younger. Uh, he writes, and I better read it so I don't miss it. He writes, don't lose touch with the people. Be adept at recognizing their enthusiasm from its very essence. It's an interesting idea. Um, be in touch with their enthusiasm. That's the word that Mao uses. And I want to come back to that in a minute. I'm going to quickly make about eight points. The first point, and I'm doing this like a runaway train, Carlos, so I, I don't uh, irritate you too much. The first point is that the Chinese Revolution in 1949 was, in a sense, a Leninist revolution. Um, and I'm going to explain what that is in about five points. Firstly, it was a revolution in the colonized world. It followed basically the colonial and national theses of the Communist International of 1920. Just remember that there was no German revolution, that the revolutions didn't take place um, in the West, in North America, in Europe, and so on. The revolutions took place in the wretchedly backward parts of the world, you know, like for instance, in the Tsarist Empire, a massive internal colony, huge parts of Asia, under you know essentially European colonialism, it took place in um, in China in 1949, Vietnam 1945, Cuba 1959, Burkina Faso 1983 didn't take place in the United Kingdom or well I don't know if it's United or even a kingdom but whatever that island is that had the uh, bad taste to come and colonize us in India, but still it was in a sense a revolution in a colony. Second. It put national liberation as the first principle, in other words, to secure the territory from imperialism. Not an easy task when China had been under a war from 1937, essentially to 1949. Not easy to secure the territory. Uh, third, enhance the lives of the people through the basic means of socialist planning and organization, as well, as, well as the transformation of land relations. I'll come back to that land relation question. So land reform, enhancement of health and education as priorities. This is an essential part of the Leninist agenda, which Mao takes full, full and directly implements it in China. Next, build the productive forces and socialized labor. This is the essence of John's book. He argues about um, building the productive forces, socializing labor. We are not Marxists who believe in socializing poverty. And so this point is essential. And John makes the point very clearly that you have to focus on how we build the productive forces, how that process socializes labor. And then the final point on Leninism is be patient in the protracted struggle to develop socialism in the world, including through the long term process of cultural transformation, something that Marxists tend to ignore. Our cultures have to be transformed. You know, uh, we come from societies with a great wretchedness in our cultural relations, caste, feudalism of the worst kind. This has to be transformed. It doesn't happen with an ax. It has to take place with a feather. It takes place over time. Now, China liberated itself at the same time as India became independent. Um, this is happening at the same time. Both enter the 1950s in a very similar situation extremely low levels of literacy, under 20% in both. India, in fact, enters 1947 at a 14% literacy rate, extraordinarily low. So many hundreds of years of colonialism, thanks for your civilization. You know, honestly, it was really helpful. It gave us 14% literacy rate. China also under 20%. Um, very poor health outcomes for the population. The agrarian question is posed in both places. I think this is important. It's not as if in India the agrarian question isn't put on the table. Um, since the peasantry is the largest section of the population in both countries. In India, 
the social relations are largely untouched. In other words, landlordism is largely untouched. There are modest forms of land reform. They are on the table, but not always implemented. In China, on the other hand, the agrarian reform law of June 1950 makes a fundamental change in the social relations of production. These reforms are finished by 1952. And China moves to cooperatives. It broke the link, essentially, between land, landlessness and poverty. This is something that continues to grip India till today. India's bourgeois landlord state promoted agrarian reform through technological inputs, largely the Green Revolution. You see, the failure of agrarian reform in India, and this is important, meant that collective structures to enhance employment and deliver, deliver social welfare were not available. You see, when you conduct land reform, the point isn't just to conduct land reform and individualize holding. You have to create collective structures that can deliver health care, education, you know, literacy and so on. Those collective structures were not built in India. Um, in China, in the early decades of the revolution, it was collective rural structures that delivered health care and education. Every member of a commune, for instance, received rural health insurance and was treated by, as things mentioned, by barefoot doctors and the cooperative medical scheme. See, China pioneers mass scale public health and builds upon the Soviet experience. Just remember, guys, that the Soviet Union comes into being, the Soviet Republic actually, comes into being during the massive influenza epidemic, the Spanish flu. And the Soviets perforce had to pioneer mass health care. It was extraordinary what the Soviets did in 1918, 19 and 20. Totally extraordinary. The Chinese learned from that. Many Soviet doctors come into China in the 1950s and help build the mass structures of rural health care. The combination of Soviet doctors and this trust the enthusiasm of the people is key. China's pioneering of mass scale primary health care, public health was so significant that it was treated as the model at the 1978 World Health Organization meeting in Alma-Ata, one of the most significant meetings in France. I'm going to ask you to go and read the Alma-Ata Declaration on the importance of primary health care. It's actually very significant for this permanent COVID period in which we're living in. So I really want you to go and read the Alma-Ata Declaration. It's built off of the experiences in China uh, from 1949 to 1978. Primary health care came alongside mass sanitation campaigns. You know, you've got to understand this. In our parts of the world, building mass sanitary campaigns are really important because you've got to break the epidemiological, you know, barriers that are posed for people. In India today, the most important ways in which, uh, not important, the, the most common ways in which people in rural India die are essentially preventable because these have to do with questions of basic public health and sanitation. If you could do this, you would be able to get past this epidemiological barrier that, that strikes at the Indian peasantry. Um, there is no reversal of this in India. In China, you see a reversal. These campaigns in the early 1950s of getting re rid of pests, of getting rid of just cleaning the streets and so on. You know, very important. In India, you don't have this. You have, you know, plague returning in India, in Gujarat, uh, within uh, living memory in the early 1990s. The five guarantees were not distributed through the central government. They were distributed also through the communes, uh, played a big role, food, fuel, clothing, education, and burial. Um, these five guarantees over time will keep getting enhanced as people's expectations rise. Just some numbers, friends, just to give you a sense of this. Infant mortality, which to my mind is a really good way to understand um, the li lives of people because it also brings women's health into the picture. Infant mortality. In China in uh, 1997, there were 38 infant, you know, in, in, the infant mortality was 38 per thousand live births. In India, it was 71, basically almost double of that. Um, it was infants with low birth in China in 1997 is 9%. In India, it was 33%. Um, infant mortality decline in China was 5.4% from 1949 to 1985. In India, it was 1.3%. So you can see India just is unable to get a grip on some of these basic issues of human life and human dignity, uh, human dignity. To lose a child that's born is one of the great traumas of, of human life. And I think to 
eradicate, let me use that hard word, eradicate infant mortality as much as possible should be a socialist goal uh, because that kind of trauma really impacts communities and so on. Education, very quickly, Carlos, I know I have about a minute to go. Education, in the case of India, while efforts have been made to improve literacy, its literacy rate in 2011 was 74% well below that of China, which is over 95%. In fact, India's literacy level is even less than China's was in 1990. I mean, I'm saying all this because I'm not, not trying to take away at all from you know, the struggles in India and the important advances made in India. But the key issue was the socializing of relations of production in the countryside in that early period. Land reform, then the delivery of health and ed education resources and so on through collective structures that breaks the chain for china it breaks the chain from the hideousness of our pasts let's not exaggerate that we inherit hideous pasts with terrible hierarchies in india we haven't broken that yet and it shows us that it takes socialism to break that chain it takes socialism to break that chain Capitalism is very comfortable with adopting old hierarchies and reproducing them and allowing old hierarchies to become the forms of power and domination in our society. That's the argument for socialism. You want an argument for socialism? It's those statistics from China on health and education. And John has all of this in his book. Thanks a lot. <laughs>